So let's get started with today's lecture on the organization of the brain and nervous system. Okay, so what we're going to be going over today are the major components of the nervous system. There are two major components, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, um, abbreviated as CNS and PNS. In addition, we're also going to be talking about some of the other components, kind of anatomical components of the brain, the meninges, protective coverings, as well as uh, the ventricular system. Okay, let's start with the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is made up of two major components, shown here in blue. It's the brain and the spinal cord, okay? The brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is basically everything out, out else outside of the brain and the spinal cord, specifically all these nerves running into and out of the spinal cord is made up of, um, uh, is what makes up the peripheral nervous system. Here you see a real brain and a spinal cord with all these nerves coming out. We've cut off uh, the majority of the peripheral nervous system, but you can see all these little roots coming off of the spinal cord. And here you see the huge kind of array that goes all throughout your body. So this is what we're going to focus on in the first part of the talk. And I want to start with perhaps the um, part of the nervous system that you might be less familiar with, that is the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system, actually let me just give you a few more definitions of both central and peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord, as I just said, and the function of these areas is to mediate all sensory inputs and all motor output. It generates behavior, both observed and non-observed. Of course, the central nervous system, the brain, is important for all our thoughts, all our plans, all our thinking. In addition, the peripheral nervous system is uh, made up of three main components that we will go over. Three main components make up the set of peripheral nervous system. The first are the spinal nerves. The second is a subcategory of these nerves called the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are special because they allow us to bring in information and give, give out motor commands for the head and the neck, specifically for the head and the neck. Spinal nerves mediate sensory and motor function through the entire body, but cranial nerves are focused on the head and the neck, and we'll see how that, that differs a little bit in terms of their anatomical organization. And finally, a third uh, component of the peripheral nervous system that we'll talk about is called the autonomic nervous system. It's, not, it's the non-conscious kind of uh, part of the peripheral nervous system. And all three components carry information into and out of the central nervous system. What kind of information? They carry sensory information into the central nervous system, and they carry motor information out. By nerves, we mean axons. Axons are the output of, of, of neurons. And so all of these nerves that we're talking about in the peripheral nervous system are really defined as axons. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about the peripheral nervous system. Uh, uh, spinal nerves, cranial nerves up here, and the autonomic nervous system, which is also kind of mixed in with all these nerves here. Yes? Cranial means head. It, it means head. So, yeah. OK, so the, the question was, what does cranial mean? And the answer is that it means head. It refers to the head, OK? So uh, 31, uh, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Um, and so these are the nerves that are carrying sensory and motor information, again, through the body, starting with the shoulders all the way down to your toes. And they're coming off this main body of the spinal cord right here. Now, what I'm going to do is take this spinal cord, so you see the person is facing this way and their back is this way. Here is a blow-up of the spinal cord, and here's an even bigger blow-up of a subsection through the spinal cord. The major components you need to understand about the spinal cord is that it's subdivided into two major divisions, what we call a dorsal division back here, closest to our back, 
and a ventral division right here, which is closest to the stomach, okay, or the, the ventrum. Uh, ventral spinal cord and dorsal spinal cord. Now we're focusing on the spinal nerves that are coming out. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves coming up and down the spine, and there are two major components that make up each spinal nerve. There is a dorsal called root, a dorsal root of each spinal nerve, and a ventral root. Sorry, dorsal root is up here, and ventral root is up um, is here. So you see these two roots coming together to form an individual one of these 31 pairs of spinal nerves. What's the difference between the dorsal and the ventral root? Well, it's very easy um, or the very uh, um, clear difference. The dorsal root carries sensory information, okay? This is the information coming from the outside and coming in. Okay, and so that makes up part of all of those nerve fibers in one of these spinal nerves. The second component is made up of what's called the ventral root up here. The ventral root is all the motor output. These are the axons that are commanding your muscles to move. So each spinal nerve has both a dorsal and a ventral root that are subdivided by whether they're bringing sensory input in or motor output out, okay? So um, one more component. So this is, this would be right here. If I showed you this picture on an exam and I pointed right here, um, you would name this as the dorsal root. These are the ventral roots. And out here is the spinal nerve, one of the spinal nerves that are coming together. Um, there's actually a pair, one on this side, one on this side, uh, to make one of these 31 pairs of spinal nerves. One more component, anatomical component, that you need to know about, and that is this little kind of bump right here. Everybody see this little bump right here? It's over here as well. This is called the dorsal root ganglion. Ganglion means a, um, uh, a gathering of cell bodies, a group of cell bodies is the definition of ganglion, okay? So all these cell bodies here are associated with the dorsal root. Those are the cell bodies that are sending one input in to bring those sensory inputs towards the spinal cord, and the other input, its axon actually, are going out and getting that sensory information from the outside. The cell bodies that are bringing that sensory information in through the dorsal root live right here in the dorsal root ganglion, okay? So I want you to know ven dorsal root, <coughs> ventral root, dorsal root ganglia, and then these two together form uh, spinal nerves. And there's pairs of spinal nerves, one on this side and one on that side. What do they innervate? Well, it's very kind of obvious. Um, they are innervating what's closest to them in the spinal cord. So this uh, uh, more uh, um, bottom part of the spinal cord innervates all the muscles and sensory uh, input for the legs. Up here in the middle, you get input to the torso. And uh, more uh, uh, up here at the spinal cord, you get input and output, sensory motor input and output to uh, the, upper, uh, um, the upper shoulders and the arms as well. So your body is covered. Now we've covered the entire body, uh, sensory and motor input and output through these 31 pairs of spinal nerves. But something is left. What about the head? Lots of important sensory information happening in the head. What kinds of sensory input do we get through the head? Sight? Hearing? Smell? Taste. Taste. Perfect. Okay. Oh, before I go over the cranial nerves, I just wanted to go over a few anatomical terms and directions that you all should know. So um, uh, we already went over dorsal versus ventral. Dorsal is towards the back in a dog or a human, any kind of animal. Ventral is towards the ventrum or the stomach. Anterior. Uh, means towards the front or towards the head. Posterior means towards the back, okay? Um, 
And medial means towards the midline of the body. Anything closer to this region right here is called medial. Anything closer to this region right here towards your ears is called lateral. Okay? So what is more medial, your nose or your eyes? Right, your nose, good, okay. Um, what is more lateral, your ears or your tongue? Ears. ears, okay, good, got it all. So anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, medial, and lateral. Okay, so we went over spinal nerves. We talked about some different anatomical uh, uh, localizing terminology. Let's talk about the cranial nerves that are innervating all these special senses. Okay, so here is a right that you and all other neuroscience students, now you're neuroscience students officially, need to learn. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and I want you to know each one of them by name and function, okay? This is, is covered very beautifully in your book. This picture, picture comes from your book, but these are important to know because they are specific, and they go over some of the most uh, um, important sensory uh, functions that we have. Now, cranial nerves are distinguished by two major features. One is that all of them innervate the head and the neck. They're kind of uh, distinguished by their anatomical specificity. But second, they're, um, uh, they're distinguished by the fact that their nuclei or the uh, uh, cell bodies that are controlling uh, both the sensory and motor output are not located in the spinal cord. Instead, they're located in the brain and the brain stem, these areas, before you get to the spinal cord, okay? So um, you might think, well, how are they numbered? They're numbered 1 to 12, and they have a very logical organization. Number 1 is uh, the olfactory bulb, and they're simply numbered by how far anteriorly they enter the brain. So this is the most anterior um, uh, nerve whose nuclei are, uh, whose kind of central governing nuclei are located most anterior in the brain. And then you go more and more posterior as you go through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay? So let's just briefly go over these. You're going to go over these in detail and learn uh, the different names and the numbers, but it gives you a feeling for um, how they're organized. Two major organizing factors of, of kind of the functions of these cranial nerves. They're either sensory only, motor only, or they're mixed. And you're going to need to know whether they're sensory only, motor only, or mixed. Okay? So let's go over some of these. And these are color coded blue for sensory, uh, red for motor. Cranial nerve number one, olfactory nerve. This is the nerve that is, uh, you can see this situated right here on the ventral part of the human brain that is um, kind of right above your nose. And um, this brings in all olfactory information. Um, it is a pure sensory nerve. Only sensory information from the olfactory sense comes in. Um, nerve number two, optic nerve. Optic nerve is uh, uh, pure sensory as well for vision. This is not a nerve that you want to mess with. This nerve comes in, it crosses right here at the optic chiasm. We're going to be looking at that in a little while uh, on another uh, uh, animal model of the human brain. Um, it's pure sensory, and this is bringing in all the visual input. Where does it go in the brain? Does anybody remember what this is called at the back of the head? What lobe? Occipital. Occipital lobe. So this is traveling from the very front of the head all the way to the back, to primary visual cortices in the back of the brain. That is nerve number two, pure sensory nerve, the optic nerve. Nerve number three four, and four are both pure motor nerves. And um, if you think about it, how many times do you move your eyes every day? How many times have you moved your eyes even in this lecture? You don't have to move your head so much, but every time I point, your eye is directed to where I'm pointing to. And there are specific um, nerves uh, that are uh, uh, dedicated to moving the eyes in specific uh, locations. Third uh, directions, I should say. Third nerve is ocular motor nerve. 
uh, is, it is controlling eye movement. Uh, fourth nerve is trochlear nerve that also controls eye movement in different directions. You don't, know, you don't have to know how they control the eyes, but just both of these are pure motor and all they do is control the eyes. Nerve number five is a very, very big nerve. It's a mixed nerve. Our first mixed nerve is nerve number five. It's called the trigeminal nerve. Um, it gives you uh, sensory information to the face but also motor information to the jaw. The jaw muscle is one of the strongest muscles in your body. You use it to eat, you use it to talk, uh, you use it all the time. And uh, damage to the trigeminal will cause uh, um, motor uh, problems both with speaking and with eating. So this is a big, uh, um, um, big mixed nerve with both sensory and motor. Nerve number six, abducens nerve, we go back to a nerve important for um, the movement of the eyes. And you think, well, why do they go back and forth? Again, this is just dependent on where these nerves input onto, um, into uh, uh, this, this brain and, and um, uh, brainstem area. Abducens nerve is a nerve that is important for, again, uh, uh, pure motor movement of the eyes. Um, seven, facial nerve. Facial nerve also is a mixed nerve, um, sensory and motor. Facial nerve, like trigeminal, has sensory information for the face. So we have two that are bringing sensory information to different parts of the face. And the facial nerve has motor input to facial muscles. It's called the facial nerve because this is the motor nerve that allows you to have all those um, emotional aspects to your face. This is the nerve that gets uh, um, desensitized when you do Botox in your face. You can no longer have emotions in your face. You can't you know, raise your eyes in surprise. That is uh, um, damage, actually, to your facial nerve. So it's bringing motor input to your facial muscles, motor input to your salivary glands. Your salivary glands is a, are modif modified muscles and very important for digestion, as well as uh, motor output to your tear glands to make you cry, okay, that allow you to cry. Okay, so that's seven. Eight, nerve eight, another pure uh, sensory input, one of our special senses. It's called the vestibular cochlear um, nerve, uh, the nerve eight, which is also called auditory nerve. Um, this allows you to hear. It brings in all our primary auditory input to our brain, as well as balance in input to our vestibular system. Okay, So that is nerve uh, eight, um, again, a pure sensory nerve. Nerve nine, glossopharyngeal, also a mixed nerve. Muscles to the throat, so swallowing. Um, you can see, see, these are some critical, critical functions. Swallowing and um, uh, uh, sensory input also to the larynx. Glossopharyngeal, nerve nine. Nerve 10, very, very complex nerve, the vagus nerve. Um, and this nerve is associated with what we're going to talk about in the next set of kind of uh, uh, peripheral nervous system uh, functions. That is part of the autonomic nervous system. The vagus nerve, again, is a big, complex, mixed nerve. It has sensory and motor inputs. Um, motor inputs to the control of internal organs. Organs. We're not talking about voluntary um, input now. This is, this is involuntary input to uh, and control of internal organs. You can't decide, I'm going to digest right now. This happens kind of internally and non-consciously. And uh, there's sensory input to um, uh, internal organs as well through the vagus nerve. Finally, the last two nerves, 11 and 12, are pure motor. Uh, spinal accessory um, uh, uh, controls. Here we're getting down into the head and neck. The sternocleidomastoid muscle, you don't have to know that. This is just a neck muscle, and it's pure motor control of this neck muscle that allows you to uh, shrug your shoulders if you like. Finally, nerve 12, hypoglossal. This is a nerve that's important for moving your tongue, OK? So um, uh, along with the trigeminal with the jaw, this is uh, very important for um, um, both eating as well as speaking. And hypoglossal damage that could happen with brainstem damage will impair your ability to speak.
Okay, 12 pairs of nerves. Your homework is to find the cleverest um, acronym to remember the 12 pairs of nerves. There are funny ones, there are dirty ones, there are sexy ones, there are lots of them. I will not give you these, especially the ones that will be most memorable for you, but I recommend that you go out and remember, go out and find your favorite acronym to remember these 12 pairs of nerves. Look it up online. It'll be uh, worth your while. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of an um, uh, overview of uh, what we're going to be going over, not this week in lab, but next week in lab, one of the great things about sheep brains is that all the cranial nerves are all in the same relative position on this ventral view of a sheep brain as they are on the ventral view of the human brain. So we may not be able to give you, you know, 20 different human brains to dissect, but we can give you 20 sheep brains. And you're going to be able to see um, this. Here's the olfactory bulb. It's huge in sheep. If you look at the skull of a sheep, we should bring one in one year. Their nose, their nose is huge, right? Sheep have big noses. And um, it's, they have a large uh, olfactory. They have very, very good olfactory sense as well. Um, here is the optic chiasm. The optic nerve has been cut off. Um, three, ocular motor nerve down here. Here's five, trigeminal, which is usually very big. It gets a little bit hard to identify the higher numbered nerves, um, 10, 11, 12 down here, but um, three or four can be easily visualized on the ventral surface of the sheep brain. And again, it's, it's in very, very um, similar positions and, and similar look as the human cranial nerve. So that'll give you a good sense of uh, the location of these nerves and allow you to practice to remember what these nerves do. Okay, now, so that, that uh, takes us through the uh, 31 pairs of spinal nerves, the 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and finally, we're co we've come to the third aspect of the peripheral nervous system, and that is called the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is, um, uh, made up of two major subdivisions, the sympathetic subdivision and the parasympathetic subdivision. These um, different subdivisions are innervating lots of internal organs, your liver, your stomach, your heart, your lungs, your pancreas, your, your bowels, and both of them are innervating exactly the same uh, structures, but they have two different functions. It's kind of a push and pull function. So let me illustrate the parasympathetic nervous system first. So tell me what happens when I say the word pop quiz. Anything? How about colonoscopy? You might be too young. How about rectal exam? Okay? What, what happens? If I was a real, if I was an MD and I said, I'm going to have to do a rectal exam on you right now, what happens? Your stomach tightens up, you get butterflies. If you think you're, if I was really going to give you a pop quiz, I'm not, um, that, I don't know if, I don't know about you, but whenever I heard that when I was a student, I got big butterflies. That is because of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's also called the fight or flight nervous system. It gets your body engaged. It gets your body involved. Why do you have that funny feeling in your stomach? Because when you have to run, actually, the, I should say the parasympathetic nervous system, um, one of its more recent uh, uh, functions was to prepare you for a pop quiz. But when we were you know, uh, um, uh, Neanderthals on the plains, uh, what it really prepared you to do was run from a lion that was about to kill you. Okay, And what it does is it takes away all the blood from those organs that you don't need right now. You don't need to digest your breakfast if you're running away from a lion. Okay, You don't need to ovulate right now. You can <laughs> ovulate later. Okay, um, And so you, you, you're pulling the blood away from these non-critical um, organs. And where are you giving it? You're giving it to your muscles, to your quadriceps, to your hamstrings, because you have to run away and you have to run away now. Okay? So this parasympathetic system gives a jolt to the system, gets that blood away from uh, the stomach, and uh, um, 
uh, and really activates, uh, uh, allows the uh, blood to pump and the, uh, uh, the um, heart to, uh, sorry, the lungs to work to be able to get you away from those uh, predators. But let's say you got away. All right, you, you survived. How are you going to get yourself back down? That is where the sympathetic nervous system comes in. Sympathetic is hooked up to all the same organs as the parasympathetic, but it slows things down. It now allows you to digest. It allows your heart to go a little bit slower. It allows your bowels to work in a normal fashion. It's called, uh, we call it the rest and digest or weekend system. This is what's happening on the weekend. You're watching the football game, you're, you're eating, you're sleeping in, you are activating your sympathetic nervous system. During the week, it's fight or flight, okay? You, you have to re react to pop quizzes, to um, uh, waiting on the elevator line for 10 minutes, uh, all these things you have to deal with, that is the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's a push and pull nervous system and uh, just know that it's interconnected in a, a push-pull kind of way to major internal organs throughout the body, okay? And oh, also, uh, the major difference between the autonomic nervous system and uh, the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves is this is more of an unconscious system. We don't, we don't control it consciously, whereas I control that I'm moving my arm right now. I can decide to move my leg up like this, okay? So this is more auto autonomic or automatic. Um, and the uh, spinal, spinal nerves and the cranial nerves are much more uh, conscious um, direction. Okay, so that is the peripheral nervous system. Let's move on now to the central nervous system. The central nervous system, as we uh, showed at the very beginning, is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. And it mediates all sensory input and motor output, generating behavior observed and non-observed. Again, brain and spinal cord. Brain and spinal cord minus these little, little um, uh, snippets of the spinal nerves. Okay, we went over uh, the different parts of the human brain. Here is the frontal lobe up here, the central sulcus. Who knows what the central sulcus uh, separates? There's a critical uh, function of this area versus this area, pre and post central sulcus. Anybody know? Yes. Perfect. He said the pre is for motor and the post is for sensory. So the central sulcus is key because it subdivides two of our primary um, functions of the brain. Pre-central sulcus, in front of the central sulcus, is primary motor cortex. These are all those... Um, primary motor neurons that are, are moving all parts of our body. When we did that exercise last uh, lecture where I had you close your eyes and wiggle your right toe, your left pre-central sulcus cells that, that innervate the toe were activating right at that moment. Post-central sulcus is primary sensory uh, uh, cortex. This is the primary sensory cortex for all your entire body. Different parts of your body are located, are, are represented in different parts of this post-central sulcus. And as you can imagine, they can talk to each other. Primary motor cortex can inform primary sensory cortex across this sulcus or fold in the brain. Great. Parietal lobe. This is the lobe important for spatial functions. Um, that is, uh, I mentioned last time that you have damage to the parietal lobe. You start to ignore that side of, the, um, of your world that was uh, opposite to the side of the brain that was damaged. So right parietal lobe damage will, will um, cause you to ignore everything on the left side of your world. Um, occipital lobe, we talked about primary visual cortex is back here. Temporal lobe is higher visual function and um, uh, uh, memory function, and here we talked about the cerebellum for fine motor movement. Okay, let's talk about uh, a few more key um, characteristics of the brain. There are all these folds on the brain. The outer part of the, of the fold on the outside, the bump of the fold, is called a gyrus, or gyri is pl plural, gyrus. 
The infold, the part that goes in, is called the sulcus. So this is the central sulcus, that, that fold that goes in. Just to give you a feeling for how much is buried, two-thirds of our entire cortical surface is within the sulci. So there are very, very deep sulci. So much so that if you flattened the entire human cortex out, it would be a square, 2.5 square feet. That's huge, OK? So why wouldn't we want to walk around with a big old brain like this that's 2.5 square feet long? What's the, what's the advantage? Anybody have an idea? It's clearly an evolutionary advantage. Yes? Yes, so that's one, one good thing. So she said there's more cells in the brain. You can fold it up. Um, yes? It's, say that one more time. Like a predator. Oh, right. Yes, if you had a big old head, the lions would probably spot you much easier than you had a smaller head. Yes, that's, that's good. But I was thinking about a more practical reason. If you had a big old head that was 2.5 square feet, how the heck are you going to fit through the birth canal? OK? Think about that for a second. Very painful, right? at least for half the people in this room. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's evolutionarily advantageous for multiple reasons. You don't want to have a huge old head that, that's uh, you know, awkward to walk around. You're going to be killed by lions. You have um, lots more cells. You can fit lots more cells in there, because this is really your computational powerhouse of your brain is the cortical surface. And for a practical reason, you have to fit through a birth canal. You can't have this big old you know, head down there. And so um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in our evolution uh, lecture. But the, the depth and the extent of these gyrations in the brain usually signal how much computational power there are. So you go to other animals that you consider very, very intelligent. Chimpanzees, um, uh, large apes, they have huge folds in the brain. So you think, OK, that, that kind of makes sense. But then you go to the lowly cow. I don't know, has anybody seen a cow brain? It has lots of folds. And you have to think, what are they thinking about? What are those cows thinking about? And I don't know. So it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. You can't just take a, take a view, but uh, take a picture of the outside and count the number of folds. It actually also has to do with the ratio of your body weight relative to the brain weight that people have, um, that, uh, um, um, that biologists have figured out uh, lead to the largest kind of intelligence quotient uh, in different species. OK, so that's about sulci and gyri. Um, we have two brains. We have a right hemisphere, and we have a left hemisphere. And most of you know that the right hemisphere is controlling everything on the left side of our body, and vice versa. The left hemisphere is controlling everything on our right side of the body. But they communicate. They communicate. They must communicate, or else we'd be you know, schizophrenic, or at least dual personalities. And they communicate through a structure called the corpus callosum. Okay? The corpus callosum, um, I'll show you a picture of that in a second, is a huge highway of axons that go from left to right. These are all the axons going from one side of the brain to the other. It is huge. It's located right in the center there. You can see it when you cut the brain in the sagittal plane, which is this way. And the two, uh, here I say this, two cerebral hemispheres are connected by fiber bridges. The major bridge is called the corpus callosum. Um, bilateral symmetry and these four lobes that we went over already. OK. so. Um, there are lots of different brain structures. That we just went over the cortical, uh, uh, major uh, cortical lobes, but there's also subcortical structures. But I always like to start with development, because it makes things simple if you see how this very complex structure first developed. OK, um, so basically, um, we are developed from a three-layered 
structure. The three layers in development, I mean in utero as you're, as you're developing your whole body, three layers are called the ectoderm, outside layer, the mesoderm, M-E-S-O-D-E-R-M, -E -E the middle layer, and the endoderm, the inside layer. So ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. The main layer I want you to know about is the ectoderm, the outside layer, because the entire nervous system develops from the ectoderm. So it's like a sheet. So let's say this is a sheet. This is a sheet. Let's do it right here. And what happens is two parts of the sheet come up and pinch together right here to form a tube, the neural tube. So the entire nervous system develops from a tube of structure. So where the walls are made up of that outside layer, the ectoderm, and the inside is just empty. We're going to see what that inside turns into at the end of the lecture. OK, so now we have, we, we have a flat surface that pinches up into a tube with um, uh, cells on the outside and just blank on the inside. Let's see how that tube develops. Here is a simple view of that tube. Importantly, the tube is polarized. There's a difference between one end and the other end of the tube. One end of that simple tube forms our entire cerebral hemisphere. The other end of that tube differentiates much less and forms our spinal cord. Okay, And then everything in the middle forms, uh, forms in the middle. OK, so here is a simple tube polarized. Here's the front end that develops into the brain. Here's the back end that develops into the cortex. And take a look at what happens at this front end here. This end uh, evaginates to puff out like a balloon and cover the rest uh, of the top part of this tube right here. So this is the, uh, um, uh, these are the cerebral hemispheres. And here are the subcortical structures that we're going to go over. And way down here is the rest of the tube, which is the spinal cord. OK? So now there are some terms that I need you to learn about uh, um, linking these early structures to what they eventually become. But again, it's just different parts of this tube. That. OK, so here is the big part of the tube. It's, it's developed even more here. This big part of the tube early in development is called the telencephalon. OK, you need to know these terms right here. You have to know what they develop into. The telencephalon, the, the most anterior part, is developing into our cortex, our cerebral hemispheres. OK? What comes next? The, these big tubes have evaginated around the next little part of the tube, which is down here. It's called the diencephalon. And look, the telencephalon has evaginated so much that the diencephalon ends up in the middle of this evagination. So the diencephalon is right in the middle. And this differentiates into two major structures, the thalamus and the hypothalamus that we'll be going over uh, particularly uh, a little bit the hypothalamus in, in this first third of the class, and certainly the thalamus in the sensory and motor parts of the, of the task. The thalamus is the major relay station for all major sensory inputs to the brain. All of them go through the thalamus. Hypothalamus is important for um, uh, major autonomic functions, um, eating, breathing, sexual activity, all that kind of stuff. That comes from the diencephalon. What comes next? The next part of the tube is called the mesencephalon. Okay? It's also referred to as the midbrain. And we're going to be talking about and looking at the two major components of the midbrain. These two lumps up here are called the superior colliculi. Superior, they're up, dorsal. Um, down here, they're called the inferior colliculi. Superior colliculi, important for visual processing. Inferior colliculi, important for auditory processing. Next comes a structure called the MET. Encephalon. Okay, that's just next down onto the tube. The metencephalon develops into the pons 
and the cerebellum. You know what the cerebellum is. The pons is basically on the other side of the cerebellum, and it's processing all the fibers from the cerebellum. Okay, we're going to look at what that structure looks like. The last structure of the brain stem before you turn into the spinal cord here is called, um, in development, the myelencephalon. Okay, and that turns into the medulla, also called the brain stem. And a lot of the nuclei for the uh, cranial nerves that we talked about are located in the medulla or brain stem. Okay, so all of these terms, very well described in your book, will, you will be responsible for. You need to know all of these terms, what part, of the, um, uh, what part of the balloon they come from, the tube they come from, and what they turn into um, um, as, as we develop. Okay, so uh, back to the human brain growth structure. Um, again, just reminding you of the functions. So it's not just the anatomy, but the functions. This is just an intro to uh, locations. We already talked about primary visual cortex here. Cerebellum, fine motor skills. Parietal lobe, spatial functions. Central sulcus separates primary motor cortex in the uh, um, anterior to the central sulcus with sensory cortex, posterior to the central sulcus. Executive functions, we haven't talked about this so much, in the frontal lobe. Um, you get frontal lobe damage and you lose your personality. That is where um, your personality, your humor, the way you talk to people, this is how you organize your world. Also, higher functions called working memory functions, being able to keep things in mind. All of those complex things uh, together are lumped together in something called executive functions, one of the highest order processing systems in the brain uh, way up here. And finally, temporal lobe, as I mentioned, important for high-level vision and memory. Oh, sorry, primary, uh, um, primary auditory cortex right here, um, um, important for, uh, um, primary auditor, uh, for, for uh, processing auditory information. And what nerve was that that was primary auditory input? Anybody remember? Yeah. Something cochlear, vestibular cochlear, nerve eight. Okay, few more subcortical structures. So what I've done here is I've cut the brain parasagittally, okay? Actually, it's sagittally, right down the middle right here. And this is what the brain looks like. Here is what I was talking about, the corpus callosum, all of this is fibers. So how do you tell the difference between whether it's fibers or there's cells there? Anybody know when you're looking at a brain structure, what is the difference between an area that has fibers versus cells? Yes? One is gray and one is white. Great. One is gray and one is white. That's perfect. Which one is gray and which one is white? Yes? Axons are white. Yes. Do you know why axons are white? Okay, good, excellent. So axons are white because they're coated with a substance called myelin. It helps the axons um, uh, um, convey their electrical activity much better. It's just a white substance. So white matter or axons are white and the cells are gray. So when you look at a brain, and we're gonna look at one in a second, um, the corpus callosum will be kind of brighter white and then the uh, cells of the cortex will be gray. Very good. So here's the corpus callosum. Here, right in the middle here, is that structure I told you was the second structure after the cerebral cortex, when the cerebral cortex kind of ballooned out. This is the thalamus, OK? And you have the thalamus kind of up here. And down here is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is associated with a very important gland called the pituitary gland. It is secreting lots of important hormones for um, your body to survive, and uh, it's located right deep to the hypothalamus, below the thalamus. So we have thalamus and hypothalamus and pituitary gland right here. Oh, sorry, here's the hypothalamus, here's the thalamus, pituitary gland. Let's move 
back down to the midbrain or mesencephalon. I told you there are two main structures. Here's the superior colliculus. You're seeing one of the bumps that is more dorsal or towards uh, the, the top, and uh, the inferior colliculus, important for auditory processing, uh, the bump on the bottom. This part is the brains, uh, the midbrain right here. And finally, we get um, um, to the next section that subdivides into the cerebellum and the pons. The cerebellum, important for fine motor movement. And the pons here is a big old hunk of white matter that is, um, uh, there, are, there are cells in here too, but a lot of what the pons is doing is taking the fibers and conveying the fibers from the cerebellum to different parts of the brain. And finally, the medulla or the brain stem is lowest here right before the spinal cord stops. So this is the view of the midline. A uh, couple of other just views to see. Here you can see the olfactory bulb again, nerve number one. Here is a little tiny view of the um, optic chiasm right there. Um, here is uh, another view of the pons uh, associated with the cerebellum in the back. Here is the medulla and the spinal cord. So pons, sorry, it's labeled right here. Medulla right uh, ventral to that, and then it goes down into the spinal cord. Of course, we're looking at the ventral surface of the brain right here, of the human brain. Okay, now it's great to be able to look at pictures, but it's uh, even better to be able to actually um, get your hands dirty and, and look at some of these structures. Here, we're just showing from a rat brain how similar some of these structures look, and I can tell you that it looks even better in a sheep brain. So could I get three volunteers? You, yes, in black, um, in purple, and you. Okay, come on up. Quickly put some gloves on. Have some gloves. Come back over here so you can face your audience. And this is a little preview of um, what we're going to be able to do, what you're going to be able to uh, um, really play with in lab, which are sheep brains. So here is a real sheep brain. You remember how big that human brain was? Little sheep brain. But look, what are these things here? This is the optic nerve. Okay, it's huge, and it's crossing right there at the optic chiasm. And um, oh, here is a big old nerve right here. That's fifth nerve, trigeminal nerve. So a lot of these nerves are visible. But what I want to do is kind of have you guys see, and why don't you take this knife, and you can cut a sagittal section right here. And you can take the huge knife, <laughs> and you can cut a section like that. Try and make it nice and clean. Good. OK, you can hand the big knife to her. And I want you to try and do a horizontal section through, through there. OK? OK, great. So let's take a look at this. So can you recognize anything in there? Mm, is this the pawns right here? A little bit high for the pawns. This is the middle of the brain right here. What's, what's in the very middle of the brain? <laughs> Take a look. It's OK. Oh, here, we'll do this side. Let's see. Hmm. What's this? Uh, ventricle? No. Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, that, uh, that's the hole. So this is the thalamus right here, the middle of the brain right here. And can you see, um, can you see a white area? It's a little bit hard because uh, this has been. It's around right. There or in here? Yeah, uh huh. So this is, he pointed out, a big white fiber bundle. This happens to be the fornix, but the uh, um, corpus callosum is, you can see it in a, a different section, um, is, uh, uh, is a big structure right here that's also very white. So unfortunately, uh, these brains, when they've been fixed a lot in tissue, um, in, in fixative, uh, the, the white versus gray covering uh, coloring is not quite as clear. But what's really clear is if you pop this out, do you see these two lumps right here? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you pop this out right here. This is the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. What part of the brain is that? Midbrain, perfect, yes. And what does the superior colliculus do? Vision. And what does the inferior colliculus do? Audition. Audition. Perfect, great. So you can see those two right here. And what is this? Us. I know this. Oh, that's the. Um, that's not the olfactory. No. It's the whole thing, it's the. Uh, in, no. Cerebellum, very good. <laughs> and so what's on the other side of the cerebellum? Gosh, uh, brainstem? Close. Um, close, the next pons. one up. Pons, pons, okay. So the pons and the cerebellum are together. So this is a sagittal section right here. So we're cutting the brain this way. This is a sagittal section. You're gonna have to know these different um, orientations. Now, we, um, what is your name? What? Henry. You. Henry. Okay, so Henry has cut it in a sagittal section. And what's your name? Laura. Laura has cut her brain in a coronal section. So here's the brain right here. Here are coro whoops. <laughs> coronal sections like this. And so we're opening it up here. And what we're able to see is right another structure in the middle of the brain. This is a structure that is... Um, that is even anterior to the thalamus that we haven't gone over yet. It's called the caudate nucleus. It's part of what's called the basal ganglia. This is a structure important for motor functions. This is the system that's damaged in Parkinson's disease. So this all through here is part of the, um, uh, the basal ganglia system right here. And you can see this hole here, which we're gonna talk about. See that hole? It's, called, it's part of the ventricular system. And then finally, what is your name? Tessia. Tessia has cut the brain in a horizontal manner, so through this way, okay? So open it up, and you see even more beautifully um, the, uh, uh, the head of the caudate nucleus here again. Here is the thalamus more posterior here, and back here you see part of the hippocampus. So you're going to be looking at both uh, uh, um, all of these different sections, sagittal, coronal, and horizontal. And um, you get really great 3D views of the brain to see not only the outside and the gyri and the sulci, but the organization of all those structures that are packed right in there, um, particularly the basal ganglia and the thalamus. Thank you very much. OK, just leave your gloves on the, on the table. Okay, great. All right. So we just went over the planes of sections, um, horizontal plane, sagittal plane. Oh, here's a great view of the corpus callosum right here, the sagittal plane of the human, and here's a coronal plane. Um, the, uh, uh, to give you an uh, orientation for some of these subcortical structures that I talked about. Um, here is a nice view. It's uh, from your book. It gives you a view of where the hippocampus is. In the human brain, the hippocampus is a tube-shaped structure that sits down here in the temporal lobe. And its axons come back up here through the fornix, and they end up in part of the hypothalamus. But the main body of the hippocampus sits down here in the temporal lobe. Um, uh, over here, we're looking at two other structures, or three other structures, that we'll talk about, part of what I call the basal ganglia. The caudate nucleus is in the shape of a tadpole. So there's a big head that's very far anterior in the brain, and then the tail that comes down into the temporal lobe. It's like a head and a tail coming down into the temporal lobe. And then tucked in, in the middle part here, located right here, are two other structures called the putamen and the globus pallidus. You'll be looking at really beautiful 3D renditions of these structures to see where they are in the human brain and modeling them in the third lab with clay. So you get, really get a, a good feeling. But all of these structures, caudate, 
putamen and globus pallidus. Those are the structures important for um, motor control, kind of initiation of motor control um, that are so damaged when you develop Parkinson's disease. The interesting thing is that it's not only a motor structure, but we've seen that uh, more recent data has shown that the basal ganglia is also important for um, processing reward information. What is a value to me? Uh, if a slot machine gives me $100 uh, profit versus $2 profit, uh, this is uh, the area that lights up to say, hey, $100 is better. Okay, so it's an interesting mix of kind of motor function, initiation function, as well as reward functions um, that has been studied extensively in the decision making field in neuroscience. Okay, and in the last 15 minutes, I want to go over um, two kind of protection aspects of the brain, the meninges and the ventricle system, ventricular system. Meninges. Meninges are the hard covering of uh, the brain, and you can see them right here in, uh, in the sheep brain. If you can see this white covering right here, it's not all over the brain, but it's like it's shrink wrapped down here because we didn't remove the meninges. Imagine the entire brain shrink wrapped with um, layers of what's kind of like Tyvex. Do you know what Tyvex is? This is kind of very strong, fibrous material. It's like a protective sac that goes all the way around your brain and all the way around your spinal cord. Though that protective sac together is called the meninges, and the major function of the meninges is protection. I'm going to give you three different names of three layers of meninges, just because it's um, easy to remember and uh, it, it does form a very important protective aspect of the brain. The outer layer of, there's three layers of the meninges. The outer layer, um, um, that what you feel and touch on the outside of the brain, is called the dura mater. Dura means hard, mater means mother. It's the hard mother, it's the protective mother, it's the most, most strongest, fibrous part of the meninges. That's on the outside. There is a uh, uh, intermediate level that's very, very delicate called the arachnoid mater. And arachnoid means, sp means spider, mater means mother again. And what this layer is, is um, just little tendrils going from the top layer, the dura mater, to the bottom layer that we haven't gotten to yet called the pia mater. Pia means soft. This is a very delicate layer that, that actually touches the surface of the brain. And the arachnoid mater are these little tendrils that's connecting the pia mater to the dura mater. The arachnoid mater is, uh, has a lot of space in there and creates what's called the subarachnoid space. What is in the subarachnoid space? What's in there is a fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. Anybody ever have a spinal tap? done to them? Or heard of a spinal tap? Yes, okay, so you heard of a spinal tap. This is the um, kind of fluid that fills the brain, and it's, uh, um, we'll talk about where it's generated, but it's flowing around um, uh, within the subarachnoid space, and what it forms is a little pillow, a little pillow for the brain. Of course, what's outside here is the skull. So you have your skull, you have your meninges, and then you have a little protective covering of, um, of, of fluid between the sac of the meninges and the brain itself. So how do you understand this? How do you, how do you remember this organization? Well, I found that one very easy way to remember this is to use a simple food group that everybody is familiar with. I'm convinced that the makers of this food group were neurodynamists that looked at the organization of the brain, because if you think about it, tofu is packaged just like the brain. You know why tofu is in this protective water covering, is because it protects it. In fact, regular tofu is about the consistency of your brain. So here, I have this very delicate thing. What do I do? Do I just you know, 
slap it in a box? No, I put a protective water covering around it just like the meninges. So I can throw it to somebody. They could throw it back. And I want my brain to, you know, be intact. And we can open it. And it is completely, fully intact. This is regular tofu. So if you want a feeling for, um, I'm not going to get that out, but um, if you want a feeling for what, what the consistency of your brain is, um, that is a pretty good model. I don't know, how many of you watch the football games this weekend? OK, so imagine, uh, they're great games, really fun games. But just every time I watch, I cringe because all of that impact onto the brain. So you have a pretty good protection. You have your skull. I mean, for me, it's great protection. I don't bang my head up against anything anytime. So I have my, my skull. I have my meninges. Um, and I'm protecting this thing that's the consistency of tofu. But what do these guys do? They batter their heads into each other. And there's, it's not surprising that they're finding long-term neurological problems associated with um, sustained head trauma, like you see um, in boxing, in, um, in uh, football, uh, even in soccer with the heading. Um, but uh, uh, this, is, this is what you have. And uh, if you're going beyond that, you're going to start damaging the brain. OK. So lastly, let me just uh, go over how this cerebral spinal fluid gets there. And for that, we go back to our uh, uh, view of uh, uh, the early uh, spinal cord as a tube. A tube has an outside wall and an inside. The inside is empty. Actually, it's not empty. It's full of cerebral spinal fluid. So it starts out as a tube, and that tube actually expands and continues to be in your brain. So there are fluid-filled chambers in your brain right now. Everybody has them. They're called ventricles, and they've developed from the inside of this tube. What do they look like in the real brain or in the adult brain? They look like this. So this outline is the empty spots in your brain that developed out of that simple kind of uh, single tube um, uh, of the neural tube. This is called the lateral ventricle. I should use my, um, this is called the lateral ventricle. There is a ventricle right in the middle of the thalamus called the third ventricle. There is a, a, a aqueduct or a little opening that goes into the fourth ventricle near the level of the uh, cerebellum. And then there's even a tiny little opening and um, a, a, a tube remnant in the middle of the spinal cord that goes all the way down the middle of the spinal cord. Again, just coming from that original tube. Now, there are special uh, um, cells that line mainly the lateral ventricles that are located here in the uh, cerebral hemispheres. And those special cells make up a structure called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus um, is a structure that, that generates cerebral spinal fluid. You're generating about 500 milliliters of cerebral spinal fluid every day. It's bubbling up from here, and it flows down here. And at this level, in the fourth ventricle, it actually has an output. Where does it output to? It outputs to the arachnoid uh, subarachnoid space. So then it flows out all the way through. And then there are openings within the subarachnoid space for that fluid to then be uh, drained out through the um, venous drainage system. You don't have to know that, but just know that there's new fluid produced all the time. What does the cerebral spinal fluid do? Well, together with the meninges, it forms the uh, protection part of the brain. And the second major function of cerebral spinal fluid is that it causes a um, uh, gradient of um, diffusion so that the, the bad kind of chemicals and, and um, buildup from your brain can diffuse down into uh, the cerebral spinal fluid and be kind of washed off. So it's kind of a, a, a rinsing kind of effect that the cerebral spinal fluid has uh, across the uh, entire brain, both within the um, 
uh, ventricles itself as it, it filters in. This is, all these ventricles are, are just adjacent to um, the brain and subcortical structures as well as uh, on the outside where it's bathing the entire surface of the central nervous system and the um, peripheral nervous system. So, uh, so here are the two major roles of ventricles and CSF protection, and the CSF provides a medium for exchange of materials and nutrients between blood vessels and brain tissue. Okay, so that is it. Um, I will see you uh, next on Wednesday, and uh, you'll be preparing for your labs on Thursday and Friday.